Um, just wanted to read one verse before we pray, which is um, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, um, verses 57 and 58. Okay, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 57 and 58. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not vain in the Lord. Just wanted to remind us of that even before we pray that he's given us the victory and our labor, our work, whatever we do is not, um, whatever we do for the Lord, in the Lord, is not in vain. Right? So therefore, we, we need to be uh, encouraged. Um, and here's this encouragement from his word to be steadfast, to be consistent, to be immovable, right? not shaken, um, and always abounding, always increasing in the work of the Lord. Okay. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you, Lord, that we have the victory through you, Father God. We thank you that you are victorious and you've turned around and given us the victory. And that victory is over, Lord, sin and Satan and death. And Father, we thank you that... Uh, Everything, it covers everything, Lord. All failures, everything, God, all defeats. You, your victory covers it all. And you've made us victor victorious in every area of our lives, Lord. And so this morning, we just want to thank you for the victory that you've given us. And yes, Lord, we thank you for the exhortation to be steadfast, to be mobile, uh, always abounding, be, to be established and always abounding in the work of the Lord. Yes, Father God, we thank you. We thank you. We're just reminded of this, Lord, even when things happen to move us, when things happen to, to shake us, Lord, that we will continue to, Lord, draw near to you, draw strength from you, and uh, be encouraged by the comfort and the strength of the Holy Spirit gives, that we will always be abounding. Or in seasons when it seems to be challenging and difficult, Lord, especially in those seasons, I pray that we will abound even more in the work of the Lord. Lord, as we draw near to you, as we sit at your feet, Lord, as we just wait on your presence, God, and uh, receive strength from you, Lord, to abound even more in the work of ministry. Father, we pray that you would bless each one of us this morning, God, touch each one of us. Yes, Lord, I pray that you will remove, God, all fear and all anxiety and all everything that seems to block, oh God. I pray that you will remove it, that we might be rooted, established in you, Father God, even stronger than before, God. Lord, in, in seasons when it seems to be challenging, I pray that we will be even more, Lord, established in you, unshakable, immovable, and uh, it will be even more abounding, God. I pray that you'll cause this to happen. We thank you. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Right, let's um, let's continue from where we left off, 2 Corinthians. Um, and I think we just started with uh, chapter 7. Right? We, uh, we looked at chapter 5, chapter 6, and then we went on to chapter 7. Um, and I think we looked at the first couple of verses. So let's um, let's just read those verses again. So chapter six, um, Paul talks about um, the promise that God had given, and he quotes from Jeremiah, right? Jeremiah thirty-two, I think. And then he um, goes on to say, um, uh, uh, quote that promise, uh, a promise of the Lord of God, saying that I will dwell among them; they will be my people. I'll be the father to them, and they will be my sons and daughters. And uh, and and the and the, the Lord promises that. So He reiterates, right, reminds them about the promise. And in chapter seven, it says, "Therefore, you know, because the we have these promises. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, 
let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Okay. Just go and go ahead and uh, project the notes um, that we might uh, just follow through on that. Um, Okay. Okay, so yeah, so chapter seven and verse one says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So um so a couple of things that we um, we can take away from um, you know, from the first verse is that Paul reminds them and then he says, you know, because we have these promises, now we have a responsibility. Okay. Now, what is the promise? Promise is the, the assurance of God's presence, the, the change in identity and uh, the um, the promise that he will be there, be our God and he will walk among us and right? continue to be with us. So, um, therefore, the call to holiness, right? Let us cleanse ourselves, Paul writes, and he says, so the thing is, uh, what we are reminded is that it is our responsibility to cleanse ourselves of all filthiness of flesh and spirit. Yes, you know, the Lord will forgive, the Lord will, uh, Lord will cleanse us by his precious blood, but we have a responsibility to, to separate ourselves from everything that, um, you know, that contaminates, that pollutes the things of the uh, the things of the flesh um, and spirit everything that contaminates we have a responsibility to cleanse ourselves to to separate ourselves and to live in a way that is free of all these things right so uh, so we cannot be um, you know we, we cannot relax in this area we need to take action right? we need to take action we need to be active in this area um, and be alert right so um so it is it is really a call to action right uh, and when we read romans 8 13 we see if you live according to the flesh you know the seriousness of it is this you know why should we cleanse ourselves why should we cleanse ourselves of all the things of the you know filthiness of the flesh of course god is not pleased um and and the seriousness of it is that it takes us to a place of separation from god you know it takes us away from that place of fellowship we, we, and takes us away from that intimacy and closeness and leads us to a place of separation. Romans 8.13, if you live, that is, if you continue to have this day in and day out, every day, if you live according to the flesh, right? according to the flesh meaning, according to the dictates of the flesh, the desires of the flesh, the directions and uh, invitation of the flesh, right? whatever the fleshly appetite is, whatever our unrenewed mind uh, you know, uh, craves for and imagines and so on. If we live according to that, what is the end result? That you will die. Right? It's a very sober warning right? uh, of the seriousness of it, that if you live according to this, you will die. But if by the Spirit, right? if by the Holy Spirit, with the help of the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body. In, instead of you living such a kind of a life, a life uh, according to the flesh, and you coming to a place of death, if you take that responsibility and put to death the deeds of the body, right? You put to death the deeds of the body. Then what happens is that you will live. Okay, you put to death. You bring an end. You you bring. A, a separation to the deeds of the body, then you will um, you will live, right? So it's it's by the spirit, right? So we cleanse ourselves by first of all being aware of all the things that you know. If you're not aware that something is, you know, something is not good for us, then we will continue to indulge in that, right? We will continue to you know go ahead and being ignorant of this, we will continue to live that way. Like, but the Holy Spirit warns us. Holy Spirit will alert us. And we need to be aware that this is something that will you know, defile us, something that will pollute us, contaminate us in the flesh and spirit. So, so to being 
um, sensitive to the the leading of the spirit is very very important right so he will show he will reveal things to us he will even the things that we are ignorant of he will since he is the spirit of revelation and wisdom he will he will teach us he will show us and secondly you know when when he reveals that to us we need to make some decisions some choices right some decision saying okay this is not good for me therefore i'm going to separate myself from this right this is not good for me this is not helpful for me therefore i'm going to make a decision okay so it's up to us to make the decision like no one else can make the decision for us right we need to decide ourselves uh, god will not make it for us he's given us free choice free will so we have to make that decision okay and and thirdly the thing is it's not a one time decision right it's not a one decision that we make but it's it's actually that we consistently follow through meaning we act according to those decisions we live according to those decisions you know what's a, what's a what's good in uh, you know how, how can it be good if we make a decision but if we live completely uh, different from that choice that we made right so so the thing is to make the decision and to follow through okay. uh, we see that in um, oh, sorry in Ephesians chapter 5 as well fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting which are not fitting but rather giving off thanks okay so what we see here is that um you see the standard he's saying you know let it not be even be part of your conversation you know these kind of things um don't even talk or discuss uh, in an encouraging manner it's not of course we need to you know when when we need to teach someone we need to say okay this is what it is and this can actually cause damage this can take you you know so he, he's saying that you know these kind of things like covetousness or uncleanness or filthiness uh, or fornication and you know and you look at verse 4 uh, of uh, Ephesians 5 it says neither filthiness foolish talking cause jesting right um which means like uh, jokes which are which are not edifying jokes which are which are not um um uh, not really uh, you know godly in in a, in a, in a man you know the, the content of it is not really uh, edifying it's not godly it's it's bordering on being vulgar right so foolish talking filthiness coarse jesting which are not fitting fitting for saints you know which is not appropriate for you as a saint of god the one who is separate so let it not be even be named among you let us let it not be part of your conversation um so that is this kind of standard that so that's a standard of consecration that is there for all all of us who are called to be saints okay let's look at verse 2 onwards so verse 2 paul again goes back and he addresses the this issue of you know the corinthians distancing themselves or not being open to paul right so he's saying open your hearts to us we have wronged no one we have corrupted no one we have cheated no one i do not say this to condemn for i have said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together okay so here um he lists lists sound three things okay that he has not done or they have not done for the church or they have avoided or living in such a manner what does he say he says we have wronged no one we have corrupted no one we have cheated no one that's verse two right? so so he and his team have not done this to those who are whom they are ministering okay first one he says we have not wronged we have not been unjust we have not acted immorally uh so, you know socially physically we've not acted in that way towards you we've not wronged anyone second one says we've not corrupted anyone you know, to corrupt means to to destroy to lead away from holiness right so we've not we've not led anyone away from that away from holiness and righteousness we've not um you know brought de decay or 
corruption into their lives. We've not destroyed anyone's lives. So we've corrupted no one. Third one, he says, we've not cheated anyone. We've not taken advantage. But we've not said anything or done anything and to place them to take benefit of their lives. And uh, we've not done that. We've not corrupted anyone. Okay, so uh, so he says these uh, these three things we've not done. So it's good for us to know that that's the standard. You know, that's the standard for ministry to not to wrong anyone, not to corrupt anyone, not to cheat anyone. Um, so very very clear, right? People uh, might be simple. People might be you know whatever the state of the people or we. Uh, or maybe, you know, they have cheated us, so we don't have to go and cheat them in return, right? So that's also a thing, right? So maybe people have done anything, done something wrong. We don't have to, in return, retaliate and do them the wrong, right? So, so Paul says this very clearly, these three things we've not done. Okay, let's look at verse, verse 4 onwards. Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I'm filled with comfort. I'm exceedingly joyful in all our tribulations. Okay. Filled with comfort, exceedingly joyful in all our tribulations. For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest and we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts, inside were fears. Nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he had, he was comforted in you. When he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. Okay, So Paul here is uh, making a very... Uh, you know, very important statement here, saying, great is my boldness of speech towards you. Paul was always courageous, always bold, always very radical in his decisions, in, in some things that he did. So um, he was bold in bringing correction as well. Like he did not hesitate. In fact, um, you know, we, we read in Galatians that he did not hesitate to even phase up to the apostle Peter, right? Um, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11 talks, up, talks about that. And when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. That's, um, let me just put the reference here. Okay, Galatians 2. Read that. He talks about how boldly he, uh, he stood for the truth, you know, just because uh, um, it was Apostle Paul, you know, someone who walked with Jesus, who, who talked with the Lord Jesus, you know, when he was in his earthly ministry, that didn't matter because what he was doing was not right. So he, he, with uh, Paul writes and he says he withstood him uh, because he says he was to be blamed. So he was he was a bold man in in uh, correcting people. And he was equally, you know, bold and boasting about people when he saw that, okay, um, you know, they they lived uh, faithful lives, or when they did, uh, you know, some things which were according to faith, he would boast about them to others also, like he says that you are, you are our epistle, okay, written in our hearts, and by the Holy Spirit. So he would talk, you know, complimentary things, and and he would. Uh, boast about others and about their faith and what God was doing in their lives as well. He, would, he was equally bold in doing that. Right? So he says that he was filled with comfort and joy in all the tribulations. Now that's a now that's a bold statement and also it's a great testimony. Right? He says, I am filled with comfort. I am exceedingly joyful in all our tribulations. Okay, here um, Paul again uh, he goes. It's a it's a continuation of uh, you know verse five, um, where he he started um, in chapter two verse thirteen. You know, it's a continuation of from that section, right? Chapter two thirteen, 
um, he says, you know, I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus, and and uh, and then so I moved to Macedonia. So so this um, verse five onwards, or verse yeah, verse five onwards, it's actually a continuation of that. Right, he's talking about that. He's continuing from um, uh, describing that. So, so let's read. Yeah. So he says, um, "I'm exceeding joyful. I'm, I'm filled with comfort in all tribulation. For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest. We were troubled on every side. Outside, outside were conflicts, and inside were fears. Nevertheless, God comforted. Okay. How did God comfort? He comforted uh, God, who comforts the down." comforted us by the coming of Titus. So that's a, that's a, that's another thing that God sends his people, his disciples, or as believers, we draw comfort. It's the comfort of God. Okay. Um, of course, God can do it sovereignly when we just be in his presence, pray, receive comfort from him, because the Holy Spirit is the Paracletos. But we also know that God sends his disciples, right? other fellow believers, to comfort. Because we are the body of Christ, what we see in 1 Corinthians 12. Right? We are the body of Christ and members of one another. So each part receives strength and also gives strength to the other part or the other member. So, um, so the thing is, the important thing for us is to understand that God will comfort us by or through another believer, through another disciple. So um, we need to be able to receive that comfort. It, it God's sending someone um, in order to comfort. God is sending someone with a message in order to comfort us. And so we, we be mindful of that and receive that comfort. Okay. So so let's um, yeah let's continue with verse five. So verse five he. You know, he was anxious, he was a Troas. Um, and we read about that in verses uh, verse 13 of chapter 2. Um, he couldn't find Titus, and there were a lot of uh, problems, a um, lot, lot of challenges. Um, so uh, so he, he moves from there, right? So here he, he writes that they were outside, there were a lot of troubles, conflicts, inside we were fears, and then he was comforted by Titus is coming. Uh, verse 7, not only by his coming, and also by the consolation with which he was comforted in you. Okay, so what happened was that um, uh, Paul was comforted by his presence and also by the by hearing from Titus about the change of heart of this Corinthian church. And he's saying that when he noticed their change of heart and how they uh, in in turn. Um, uh, how they ministered to Titus, like how they helped Titus and how they comforted Titus. So Titus comes and shares that with Paul. You know, when he told you of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. So this was a great, a great sense of comfort and rejoicing for Paul uh, when he came there. So, so the thing is, um, uh, something happened. Right? Something happened in the Corinthian church when he went there on the way to Macedonia. When he dropped in, he was actually preparing, planning earlier to come back and spend some time. But he went there uh, mostly unannounced and he noticed certain things in the church which were not good spiritually, morally, which were not good right, in the church. And so he uh, went there, he made those corrections, he seems to have spoken um, uh, you know, in a sharp manner and also written to them. Right? So, the, so the, the Corinthian believers were, were upset and it says that they actually sorrowed, they were sorrowful um, uh, in, a, in a godly manner. Okay, so let's look at verse 8. So he says, for even if I made you sorry with my letter. Okay. So he, he wrote to them. Of course, first was his visit. And then he wrote to them. And uh, 
he says that I did not regret it, though I did regret it, for I perceived that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Okay. So he wrote to them, and then uh, uh, it it really upset them. They were sorrowful um, when they received the letter. Okay. Verse nine. Now I rejoice that not that you were made sorry, but your sorrow led to repentance for you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing okay. so what is that so it says that this is what happened that you sorrowed in a godly manner okay which means that you can also sorrow in a ungodly manner be sorrowful in an ungodly manner Right. Um, so, verse 10, godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. And it's not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. You know, you see that just like how the things of the flesh, okay, if you live according to the, uh, according to the things, according to the flesh, you will die. Okay, that's what we read there. Right? But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Like we read in Ephesians. So here we see that even ungodly sorrow, and the sorrow of the world, if that is not checked, if that is not resisted, you know, if you do not receive the comfort of the Spirit and continue to live according to the sorrow of the world, if you let it completely over, overwhelm us, that also produces death. That also causes us to separate ourselves from God. That also causes us to move away from God and, and it takes us to a place of separation and end. Okay, So very important. We need to understand that. So it says godly sorrow leads to repentance, leads to a change of heart, leads to a change in the way we live, it is sorrow, but it's it's godly in nature. Right? So what, it is, what does it uh, do? Godly sorrow leads to repentance in life. It leads to conviction of sin. leads to hope and change. Right? And when we sorrow in a godly manner, it, we consider what are the things that I can do to change? What are the different options that are there that I can, um, I can consider to change? Whereas the opposite of that happens when there is sorrow of the world. Okay. That leads to death, that leads to condemnation, that leads to more hopelessness and take, takes us further and further into that sorrow, which is sorrow of the world, you know, like depression or anxiety. And um, so, which is not good, which really is, uh, which really destroys the person. Right? So, so godly sorrow does not destroy the person. Rather, it, it produces repentance. So what happened because of godly sorrow? Okay. So he says, um, verse 11, for observe this very thing that you sorrowed in a godly manner, what diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all things, you proved yourself to be clear in this matter. Therefore, Although I wrote to you, I did not do it for the sake of him who had done the wrong, nor for the sake of him who suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God may, might appear to you. Okay, so um, so we see here that um, uh, several things happen because of that godly sorrow. Right? Uh, so we, we see a, a whole thing listed there, diligence and uh, a clearing of oneself, an indignation, okay, fear, and vehement desire, and and wanting to prove to be clear to to clear the oneself of all those wrongdoings. So this happened because of the letter Paul wrote, and because it produced godly sorrow and led the believers to a place of repentance, and they wanted to just clear themselves of all this. Um, they were alarmed and they, they, you know, it, they reignited a fervor and a passion and, uh, and a zeal 
right? So that is what happened. And you see that it's quite opposite to uh, sort of the world which produces condemnation and and uh, you know you're helpless and it's um, it, it's not healthy at all, right? So that is what we see. Okay, verse thirteen. Therefore, um, we have been comforted in your comfort, and we rejoiced exceedingly more for the joy of Titus, because his spirit had been has been refreshed by you all. For in anything, for if in anything I have boasted in him to him about you, I am not ashamed. But as we spoke all things to you in truth, even so our boasting to Titus was found true. And his affections for you, uh, and his affections are greater for you, as he remembers the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling you received him. Therefore, I rejoice that I have confidence in you in everything. Okay, so that's how chapter 7 concludes. So he's saying, we've been comforted in your comfort, and we have been exceedingly, you know, I rejoiced exceedingly more because of the joy of Titus. Titus was refreshed by you, which means they treated him well. They um, they also received him well, received his words, received his ministry, everything. And it was after that time right, when Paul corrected them. So, uh, so he, see, he sees these that most of them have just come around, have have realized that what they were doing was wrong, and so on. So, um, so which was good, and so he rejoices, rejoices, and he says, "No, I have confidence in you in everything." Okay. So, um, so some of the highlights of this chapter, right? Paul exhorting the believer to take responsibility for their actions, to cleanse themselves of all filthiness and flesh. Okay, so, um, um, so th that is something that we see. And then he, in fact, invites them to uh, to to not dis distance themselves from him and the team, but invites them and he says, you know, you just open your heart, don't be hard-hearted. And also talks about uh, one of the key things that he says is that uh, is he testifies and uh, he says that we have not cheated, we have not corrupted, we have not wronged. And he also talks about how he has been comforted and he's joyful, exceedingly joyful in all tribulation. Okay, that's that's a that's a great testimony. And uh, and he says that he was comforted. So we learn something important about God's comfort being extended to us as believers. The Holy Spirit does that. Holy Spirit comforts us. He sends people to comfort us. Right? He sends his people to comfort us. So um, when we, um, you know, the, uh, the important thing is this, that when we do not allow people to minister to us or when we distance ourselves, then we actually distance ourselves or block whatever God wants to do in our lives through other people. So we actually stop God from doing that, uh, or we resist uh, resist God. Right? We quench the work of the Spirit. Okay. So, um, so Paul, uh, you know, in this chapter, we we see all that, and we also notice that well, the whole situation has been changed. Um, he, he he spoke to them. So we see something about Paul's life as well. The, how bold he was in correcting. He did not uh, neglect uh, correction. Okay, he sometimes he had to do it in a firm manner. Sometimes he had to take some very very bold decisions. He had to, you know, put that person out of fellowship. Right, that's what we see. Right, this person who was living in a very immoral lifestyle, continuing to live in that immoral lifestyle, he had to take that strong measure of putting that person out. So we see something about Paul's uh, zeal for the Lord and zeal for God's people. You know, the, the, all these things were done not because, you know, he wanted to make people feel bad or he wanted to, you know, uh, like he wanted to destroy people's lives, but it, it was all done for edification, right? Um, knowing the na nature of God, knowing the character of God. So it was all done for edification. Okay, so any um, 
any questions here before we go on to the next chapter okay. or anything that you want to share anything that you noticed in chapter 7 um you can do that you can share what is it that um, that you noticed what is it that you uh, found to be helpful uh, for your own lives anything that you noticed okay what was highlighted for you what did you find to be helpful what did you notice for the first time maybe or what was it that was reiterated to you anything from chapter 7 okay maintaining our responsibility yeah um and it's a it's a very important thing right we can't uh, you know the responsibility is god has you know it is god who has actually sanctified us it is he who has called us you know separated us but it is our responsibility as we live our lives to 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 live you know to to live in a, in a manner cleansing ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh now that's that's our responsibility as believers as consecrated ones yes uh, and if you notice verse 1 you know, it says uh, let us cleanse ourselves perfecting holiness okay which means it's a, it's a work it's a it's a it's a process and it's continuous right so it's it's a continuous thing so and that this continuous work of perfecting holiness is is our responsibility as believers as much as we you know we go before him and we worship him and we spend time in his word are we perfecting holiness in the fear of god right in, in our reverential fear of god in our deep respect for god are we perfecting holiness um is is it uh, is it happening in our lives that's a question right are we going from one level of like living a holy life to another level of holiness um that's a question to ask ourselves yeah anyone else okay kiran also taking responsibility mm. anything else that uh, noticed or you wanted to share see one thing that um, we also notice here is that um um Paul being very very open and transparent okay so um especially when you see verse 5 he says okay this is the trouble that we faced okay um and uh, he he's quite uh, you know just as he is bold he is also very very transparent and he says you know inside we are fierce meaning Hey, there were times that we, we were fearful he doesn't say you know I'm, i'm the apostle i've got so many revelation and understanding and you know i walk with god you know, i had this encounter therefore i'm not you know uh, i don't have any fear no uh, as a human being he experienced fear and he says you know outside were conflicts inside were fear so we see that he was very very real very open and transparent about his life about his ministry so there was nothing to hide right and that in fact gave him even more boldness right that's something that we see you know he was extremely bold and uh the fact that he lived such a very transparent life that gave him even more boldness right he was right before god and he wanted to be right before man and uh, he lived that kind of a life okay okay so then uh, if there's nothing then let's move on to chapter 8 okay so chapter 8 he talks about some uh, something about money about giving about um, generosity financially financial aspects of it um so let's let's read through it okay 
1 Corinthians um, 16 also he talks about uh, you know he, he he actually talks about um, something that he, in, he had instructed the churches in Galatia right so uh, 1 Corinthians 16 and verses 1 to 4 now concerning the collection for the saints as I have given to the churches of Galatia so you must do also on the first day of the week let each one of you lay something aside storing up as he may prosper that there be no collections when I come and when I come whomever you approve by your letters I will send I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem for it is fitting that I go also um, but if it is fitting that I go also they will go with me okay so he give we we um we saw that that instruction he's giving the believers the corinthian church saying you know on the first day when you gather together uh you know you put aside something um and as the lord prospers you send you keep aside this um and i will you know send it through whomever you nominate that is saying uh, whomever you approve you recommend uh, with your letters i will send and to bear them bear your gift to jerusalem like they were uh, collecting for the believers who were poor who were undergoing some kind of financial difficulty in jerusalem and for that they were doing this okay. so um, he addresses that aspect here in chapter 8 okay, okay. so there's the map of um, uh, the uh, map of uh, map which uh, shows Corinth and the surrounding area. Right, so you see that Macedonia, you know, it has Berea, Thessalonica, Philippi, you know, all these coming under the entire region of Macedonia. Okay, so verse eight, uh, sorry, chapter eight, verse verse one. He says, "Moreover, brethren, we make known to you." the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. So when he says church of Macedonia, it refers to that entire region. All these cities are pa part of that region, right? Um, so, yeah, so this is what he says, that um, the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a uh, great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded abounded in the riches of their liberality for i bear witness according to their ability yes and beyond their ability they were freely giving imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints okay so uh talk about uh, this gift and the believers in uh, it talks about, we read something about the believers in Macedonia. So, the, so he says that they were poor, actually. You know, they, they, they it is not like they were rich. They were, it says they were, you know, and their deep poverty, meaning that they were, they were really not well to do at all. Right? They were, use the word poverty, which means that they didn't have much. Um, but the thing is, they, they were rich in their generosity, in their giving. So despite, um, you know, they were, there was, despite the fact that they did not have much, they gave their all. Whatever they had, they gave. So they were, um, uh, they were rich in that sense, right? they, in their giving, in their generosity. Right? And he says that the grace of God enabled these believers to give. And uh, it was, you know, this is how the grace of God operated, that, uh, they were God's grace led them to be generous, even beyond their ability to give. They give. They gave for the work of uh, ministry, right? And they uh, and they gave actually for the the others who were poor in Jerusalem, the other believers, when they heard about it, and when Paul told them about this need, so they gave beyond their ability. Okay? Um, verse four says uh, that they actually implored, right? Uh, imploring us, meaning begging us. Um, with much urgency that they would receive, that Paul would receive the gift. So they begged Paul and said, you know, we want to be, uh, we want to be associated. We want to have this fellowship of ministering to these saints. So, um, you know, you take this and give it to them. Okay. Um, 
verse 5 and not only as we had hoped but they first gave themselves to the lord and then to us by the will of god okay so that's the that's the thing you know they it was not just a giving of money or giving of finances but they gave themselves to the lord they gave themselves to their lord they gave their lives to the lord first first of all uh, it was not that they put something in the offering but their lives they gave to the lord and that's the order that's the correct order right uh, sometimes people think that okay i've given and um, and i've done my responsibility you know i've given financially i've done my responsibility you know i can well, i i don't have to you know I, I can live how i want right or my life need not be in surrender to the lord right? I'm, I'm, i'm giving anyway you know i'm giving off my riches i'm giving you know maybe uh, there may be a person who's wealthy you know I'm, i'm giving so much and this is what god has uh, led me to do so i'm giving and and you know i just stop to that i don't want to go any further or deeper like what happens is like spiritually we can be shallow like spiritually we not need not be you know seeking the lord or surrendering ourselves to the lord and just be you know generous in this one aspect and but we see here in verse 5 that they gave themselves to the lord they surrendered their lives their agenda their plans everything to the lord and then they gave of their substance right then they then they gave to uh, they gave financially by the will of god okay, by the will of god meaning that they consult, consulted the, um, the, the what what god's desire was what god's will was and they chose to do that okay um so their life was not detached or far away from their giving you know both went together okay so uh, that is something that we see right? and um, when our heart is fully surrendered and then um, when we give financially you know that pleases god and it's according to the will of god that pleases him okay right So let's look at verse 6. So we urge Titus that as he had begun that he would also complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything in faith and speech and knowledge and all diligence and in your love for us see that you abound in this grace also. Okay so um, you know uh, you see earlier that Paul mentioning that you know as a church you'd come short in no gift okay you are you are blessed um in all utterance in all knowledge you know you're, you don't you don't come short you don't fall short in anything so um he says that you know you are you are bound in all these things in faith in in uh, you know uh, in knowledge in speech uh, and uh, and in your love for us as well see that you are bound in this grace you know, this grace meaning this uh this ability to give and to you know to give generously see that you abound in that you increase in that also okay okay so we'll um take a break we'll stop here and and then we'll come back and continue <laughs> 